I'm going to get you to stand again as we read the psalm. You know, when we worship God together, um, when we read God's word, that is the only part of the entire service that is inspired by God. The rest, even the sermon, is not inspired. That's why we always tell you, whenever you hear a preacher preach, examine it. Always go back to the scripture. Always examine and re-examine. But the word of God is inspired by God, and so it is right to stand. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his sheep. Uh, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. Well, we just come, and as we have come together this morning to worship you, we thank you for the privilege of coming together and doing that. We thank you that we can worship you through song, we can worship you through the offering, we can worship you through the study of your word. As we do that now, we pray that you will speak into our hearts, that you will cause us to recognize not only that it's good to worship you, but why it's good to worship you, and how it is good for us to be those who gather together to worship worship you. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. As you know, I'm downstairs with the children, at least uh, try to be there. The summertime has been a little bit different, but during the year, once a month, I'm downstairs. And um, during the regular uh, season, uh, and even this morning, um, we do a, a, a time of worship with the little ones. So those are the children that are two years old, up to five years old. And we're downstairs, and we have music, and we sing songs. And one of the songs that we sing is This Little Light of Mine, and it's actually a light bulb, and it's marching, and it's on this big screen, and, uh, and the kids love the song. And in the song, there is this statement, I will clap my hands, and then of course they all clap their hands, and I will stomp my feet, and they all stomp their feet, and I will shout, shout. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard them or not, but man, I'm telling you, they can shout. They really can. It's amazing how loud two to five-year-olds can be. Somewhere along the way, though, we grow up, and we feel that it's not dignified to shout. Except, of course, if we're at a sports event, and our team scores, maybe that winning game, you know, that, that final game, and then we're willing to go crazy and, and carry on. Well, in this psalm, Again, the author is not known in who the, the author of this psalm is, but we're a call to throw caution to the wind. We're called to shout joyfully. You know, to shout like you might if, again, your team wins and, and they score. You know, that, that final game and, and it's overtime because it's been a really tight game. It's the seventh game in the Stanley Cup and it's the final game and it's the, the final last minutes and it's that overtime and whoever scores wins and your team wins. What do you do? You just sit there? No, you shout. You carry on. You say, you, you, you just, you're almost out of your mind. And that's what this psalm is saying, how we ought to be when we worship God. We ought to shout. And we'll talk about that a little bit more this morning as we look at this passage. A call to all people everywhere. I love this. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. All the earth. Again, this is a call to all humanity, all humans, all people, everywhere, in every time frame, in every place. We recognize that this is a Jewish text. You would think that the call to worship, if the psalmist was writing this, that they would have said, Shout joyfully to the Lord all Israel. But that's not the call. Shout joyfully to the Lord all believers. 
But that's not the call. It showed joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Again, you would have thought that it would have been simply for Israel. And certainly the people in Jesus' day thought that it was just for Israel and that it was really just all about Israel. But the call is universal. The call is gone out and it is for all of us. This was a call to all people everywhere in every time frame. In essence, what this is, is a glimpse of the gospel. It's a glimpse of the gospel. It's, it's kind of like that, the gospel in, in, in seed formation. You know, here it is, a call to all the world, to everybody, in every place, in every time, to worship God. Of course, we will all one day recognize God as God. Paul writes about that in Romans chapter 14, verse 11. He says, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So in Romans, it's very interesting. He says, you know, that every person, everybody, each person here this morning, the people that live on our streets, the people that we bump into at the mall, the people that we work with that curse and swear right now and do not honor God in any way, shape, or form with their lips, one day, they will all praise God. That's what Romans tells us. Now don't misunderstand that to mean that they'll all be saved. Okay? We'll, we'll, we'll go there. In Philippians, God says everyone will bow you know, to him and recognize that he is Lord. In Philippians chapter 2. Everybody will know that he is Lord. The call is for everyone to worship the Lord as God. The Lord God as God. And again, we've talked about this many times, but either we will choose to do that in this life, and if you choose to do that in this life, in the, if in this life you choose, by the grace and the mercy of God, to call upon God and to worship him, to give honor and glory to him, and to praise his name, it will be unto salvation. And so it's in this life that we have to make that decision. In this life, we have to decide whether or not we're going to worship God, whether we're going to serve him, whether we're going to receive Christ as our personal Lord and Savior or not. And if we do, and we praise him as we're called to here in this psalm, it will be for our salvation. On the other hand, we will all bow to him on that judgment day. Everybody will bow. There is not a person that has ever lived on the planet that will not bow their knee to God. You're here this morning, you say, I'm not going to bow. There is no way. I want to live my own life. I want to do my own thing. I'm not going to bow. You can make that choice here and now. But one day is coming, and you will bow your knee before God. Unfortunately, that day, it will be to your condemnation, not your salvation. So the call, of course, is come and worship the Lord. Come and shout joyfully. Come into the presence of God today for your salvation. This psalm is a great psalm. The call, of course, is a three, three things that he calls us to. Shout joyfully. Shout joyfully. Some shout at God when they're angry with God. I like the language here. Shout joyfully to the Lord. Don't shout at God. Shout to God. And there is a big difference. For me to be talking at God because I'm angry with God or I don't like whatever you know, has happened in my life and I'm speaking to God in that kind of a fashion, that's one thing. But for me to talk to him, to have a conversation with him, to show him how much I really love him, that's something totally different. 
the call we have on our lives is to is to shout joyfully when's the last time you were so overjoyed with what the lord is doing that you simply couldn't help yourself but shout with joy to the lord when's the last time that was true for you i don't know maybe maybe you were out somewhere and and and, and you're just you know Probably not in the middle of a mall, but you know, maybe out in, in, in nature somewhere, and, and you just saw something that was just so glorious and so beautiful, you couldn't help yourself but say, God, that is beautiful. Thank you. Or some circumstances happened in your life, and God worked it out in such a way that all you could do was shout and say, God, thank you. When's the last time that was true for you? You see, this call here is about daring to be open. Open about our love for God. Because we're encouraged here to shout. Shout joyfully. Now, this does not mean a disorderly service where people just shout inappropriately at inappropriate times. That's not what it's talking about. It's not when you're gathered together just carrying on and, 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 and making you know, such a an approach that when people come in here they say they're a bunch of crazies that's not what it is no but even there and I, I say this as a Baptist cautiously sometimes we are just a little too reserved in how we worship God and we don't have enough expression and we don't dare maybe even say hallelujah or amen or praise God yeah, right there. Thank you. And, and, and we, we struggle with that, right? And yet here's the call. And then, of course, serve with gladness. You know, so the second part that he's called us to is you know, not only to shout with joy, but we're also to serve with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness in verse 2. Serve with gladness. Serving the Lord out of duty is not the best way to serve him. Now, I want to pause here for a minute because there are times that each and every one of us face in life when the only way we can serve God is out of the fact that, you know what? I know this is what God's called me to do. Right now, I don't feel like it. Right now, there is not much joy in my life. Right now, it is hard. Right now, I just, I just need to get through the day, or I just need to get through the week. And so out of quote-unquote duty, I am going to serve the Lord because I have committed myself to the Lord, and no matter what comes my way, even no matter how I feel, I'm going to serve him. And that's okay. And we all have times in life when we will experience that. But if that's all you're experiencing, I think we need to examine our heart. Serve with gladness. Serving out of a heart of gladness because you recognize all that the Lord has done for you. That's what the call is here. Serve with gladness. Serve with gladness because you recognize God has done so much for you. God has saved you from your sin. God has redeemed you. God has done so many wonderful things, not just in your salvation, but also in your life itself. In other ways, all you can do is serve him with gladness. And then come with joyful singing. Come before him, in verse 2, with joyful singing. Joyful singing, singing that flows out of the joy that we have in the Lord. May we be a people that just love to sing praises to our Lord. That song there, I can't remember which one it was, but a couple songs back, and um, Sam was doing the fancy thing on the guitar there. Yes, and, and my wife's response was, man, they've really stepped it up. That was great. That was good. That was, that was you know, a, a good opportunity to worship God. And, and here the thing is, is sometimes we come and we sing and, and we just simply go through the motions because that's what the church does and we get together and we go through and we sing because that's what we do. But is it really coming from a heart of joy? Is it really coming from the fact that we recognize who God is and how much we love him and how much we appreciate all that he has done for us, that we're singing out of that joy? That's the call here. 
that we would sing that our singing would flow out of the joy we have in the Lord. May we be a people that just love to sing praises to the Lord. May we do that on Sundays when we gather together here. But may we also do that at home. May we do that wherever we might be. And, and I mean, I've told you in the past, I used to ride a, a, not a motorcycle bike, I wasn't that cool, but just a pedal bike. And I'd be singing to the top of my lungs. And every once in a while, you come around the corner and there'd be somebody there and they'd be looking at you like kind of weird. But I didn't care. And sometimes we lose that. It's okay to sometimes make a fool of ourselves because we're praising God. We're singing to the glory of God. Sing out of the joy that you have in Christ. May we be a people that can't help ourselves. We just love to sing the praises of our Lord. And I know you say, well, I can't sing, but I've told you in the past, I joined a choir when I was a kid, and they told me just mouth the words. So you don't have to have a great voice to sing praises to the Lord. The Lord doesn't care about the voice. He cares about the heart. The second main point this morning is this. Know God. Know God. Know that God is God. Verse 3, know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Understand that there is no God beside our God. God is clear on that. There is no other God beside me. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 5 speaks to that very clearly. And throughout the scriptures you will see. And that means that all other quote unquote gods are simply idols. They are man made. Man made. It doesn't matter what religion it is. It doesn't matter what God it is that they worship. If it is not the God of the Bible, who is the creator of all things, who is the Father of Jesus Christ, who is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who entered into this world out of love for the people he created, who turned their backs on him, if it's not that God, they do not have God. They have an idol, a man-made idol. Recognize that we did not make ourselves. God made us. One of the big differences between our God and all other so-called God is who made whom. Who made whom? You know, you'll listen to some of these intellectuals. They'll talk about the fact that, you know what, um, humans created God and the need for God because of our, um, you know, basically, we need something bigger than ourselves, someone or something that we can be accountable to because somehow we can't hold ourselves accountable and something bigger to live for and so forth. And so somehow in all of that, we've created God. And the reality is the vast majority of humanity has done just that. They've created gods, gods that suit them. We have a God, a God who has always been, a God who is eternal, never had a beginning, will never have an end. Our God made everything there is. Our God made us. And then accept that we belong to him. He does not belong to us. Because God made us, we belong to him. God does not belong to us as some little genie in a bottle. And we are not our own. I don't belong to myself. I do not own myself. I do not have a right to my own life. I don't have a right to my own life. I am not my own boss. I am not in control of my life. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 says, For we have been bought 
with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. This is cool. God made us. God bought us. So we are doubly his. Doubly his. He made us to start off with. There's a little illustration, a story about a boy who made a sailboat and he put it on a little river and somehow he got out of control and, and, and it took off and it went down the river and, and he lost it. Couldn't find it. And I don't know if it was months later or a year later, he goes to a little town further down the river and sure enough, in the secondhand store is his sailboat that he made with his own hands. So what did he do? He went home and he got all the money he could together and he went and he bought it. That's the picture. God made us. In Adam and Eve, God lost us. Jesus talks about that. That's the whole thing of the prodigal son. And then God bought us with the very blood of Jesus Christ. So that brings us to the second part of this, and that is know who you are. If we want to know who God is, we need to know who we are. Number one, you are not God. You are not in control. And I hate to burst your bubble, but you are not the most important most important being on the planet. The world does not revolve around you. I know for some of you that's just a shock. Wait a minute here. I, I thought it revolves around me. I thought it was all about my life and what I want. It was good for me. But it's not about you. Also, you are not self-made. You're not self-made. You did not bring yourself into existence. God brought you into existence. And many people have this attitude. They say, well, God brought me into existence. And yes, praise God, he brought me into existence. But man, I have made myself the person that I am today. <laughs> and even that is a fallacy. You did not make yourself into the person you are today. God did. God brought about every circumstance in your life to bring you to where you are today. God brought about every circumstance, both the good and the bad, every good thing that could possibly be good for you that would have encouraged you and blessed you and made you feel strengthened and encouraged and every bad thing that would have hurt you and caused you to cause pain and cause you to suffer and cause you to have to really reflect upon who you are. All of that God brought together, that famous verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, God causes all things to work together for good. That all things, that's both good things and bad things from the day you were born, in fact, from before you were even born, from the day you were conceived, until the day you come to faith in Christ, and until the day you are made into the image of Christ. All things God uses in your life to form you into the person that you ought to be. You did not make yourself. God made you. You were made by him. You are his. You can deny it. You can pretend that you're not his. You can live as if you're not his. But you are his. And one day, you will have to give an account. One day, you will stand before him and your knee will bow. Give thanks. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, verse 4, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Give thanks. Come to the Lord with thanksgiving. The joy of entering God's gates. For the author of this psalm, he would have pictured the tabernacle. He would picture the tabernacle and the gate that allows you to enter into the place where you could worship God. Now recognize, for us today, we can worship God anywhere. For the Jewish people, to worship God, you had to enter into the gate. You had to go into the tabernacle. That is where you worshiped God. And so this call is to enter into the presence of God. To enter into the presence of God and to do so with thanksgiving. The call was for the world to come to the tabernacle to worship God. For us, the call is simply to draw near to God and to worship him. Give thanks. Our thanksgiving ought to flow out of our joy of entering God's gates. 
We have such a great privilege to call, call, our, uh, call our Heavenly Father at any time. Think about that. For a Jewish person, they would have to travel. And they'd have to go down to Jerusalem once the temple was built and enter into the temple. Prior to that, they would have to go to where the tabernacle was and they'd have to travel to get there. And they would go there and they would spend time with God, but then they would leave and they'd have to go home. For us, at any point in time, no matter where it is you are, at any point in time, during any point of the day, you can simply enter into the very presence of God. You can come before his throne. At any point. And the psalmist is saying, do so with thanksgiving. Do so with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and not resentment. I put this here because too often we come into the presence of God with an attitude of resentment. God, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? God, how come this is happening in my life? Why is this going on? Lord, what? You know, and we come to God with that attitude. Again, thankfulness and not anger. Again, same here. I've entered, I put this in here because too often people shake their fist at God. They come into the presence of God with their fist shaken. How dare you, God? How dare you? You treat me so poor, so bad. My advice is be careful. Be careful. Yes, the psalmist often expresses anger with God, but he never did so without respecting that God is the Almighty God. And he deserves respect. Always remember, when you're talking to God, that you're talking to the one who made you, you're talking to the one who owns you, you're talking to the one who bought you with his very own blood. Come with thanksgiving. Come into his presence with praise. What a great call for us to enter his courts. And again, so on the one hand, we say come through the gates, but, it, but it's not just come through the gate and then kind of stand there, but when you have the tabernacle, then you would enter into the gate, but then there was the courtyard, and you could go into the courtyard, and you could go there, and you could mingle, and you could be and with God's people, and you could worship God, and you had a lot of freedom there. And the call is to enter not just through the gates and kind of stand at the gate and just kind of be cautious, but to enter in fully and to praise God. What a great call for us to enter his courts. Here again was a place that we are all welcome to enter. Gentiles had some restrictions, but this is a call to get close to the Lord. It's a call for you and I to get close to the Lord, to be able to spend time with him. Come into, his pres into the presence of God with praise. Again, we ought to come in praising the Lord. How is your time with the Lord? Do you come praising him? Or do you come com complaining to him? My encouragement to you is come praising the Lord. Is life hard? Yeah. At times, life can be hard. Are there things to complain about? Absolutely. Can God handle our complaints? Yeah, praise God, he can. And we can go to him with our complaints. But he wants us to come not just with our complaints. He wants us to come praising him. And my encouragement is, enter into his presence praising him. And it's amazing what happens when we do that. A lot of those complaints just kind of disappear. Come in blessing his name. Again, blessing his name is another word again of saying praise the Lord. So come in praising the Lord. It's interesting how much this psalm uh, emphasizes, uh, you know, the idea of praising the Lord. When I bless your name, what I'm doing is I'm literally saying good things about you. I speak about you and I say good things about you. I'm blessing your name. I'm saying this person is a good person because they've done this and this and this. This person is a good person because they have this kind of a character or whatever it might be. If you tell people why you like them or what a good person they are because of what they have done, you are 
again, giving praise to them, what they've accomplished. The idea is that we come into the presence of God speaking to him about all that we love about him. Coming into God's presence and saying to God, God, I love this about you, and I love that. I, you know, again, the question is, when's the last time that you told God what it is that you love about him? When's the last time you did that? Why not start today? Why not start today saying, going to God in prayer and just telling him, God, I, I really love this about you. It could be as simply as telling him how much you appreciate the cross of Jesus Christ. What a great place to start. God, I thank you so much that you sent Jesus to the cross. I love you so much that even though in Adam I turned my back on you, in Christ you chose to save me. What a blessing. The things that we can share, saying to God, blessing his name. And then why should we do that in verse 5? Because God is good. God is good. For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. God is good. Life circumstances might not be good, but God is. Maybe life is hard right now. Maybe you lost your job or didn't get that promotion that you felt that you should have had. Maybe you have been struck by illness. Some of you maybe have recently lost loved ones. I know some of you have. And it's hard to cope. Maybe life has caused you to wonder about God's goodness. You said, you know what? I don't know about the goodness of God. I, I read about it. I hear about it. But man, life is hard and, and the things that I'm experiencing don't tell me that God is good. Well, here in this passage, we're reminded that even though life may be hard, God is good. And God's goodness does not end because of the bad things that are happening to us. God's goodness is seen in his loving kindness. His loving kindness is everlasting. It never ends. It never comes to an end. There's no point in time when the loving kindness of God that is extended to us ends. It is first seen, God's loving kindness is first seen in the cross of Jesus Christ. If you ever doubt the loving kindness of God, look at the cross. Look at the cross. Just go to those chapters in the Gospels and read through them and think about what it meant for God to send his son to the cross. What it meant for Jesus Christ, God incarnate, to go to the cross. What it meant for the Holy Spirit to empower Christ to go through with the cross. All because of his love for us. His loving kindness extends to us. It's everlasting. His loving kindness is experienced in the times of grace to overcome when we just can't carry on. You, and we've been there. You get those days where you just say, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get through today. And then God just gives us that extra grace that we need to get through. And we don't know where it came from. We don't have it. But it came from him. God's goodness is seen in his faithfulness and his faithfulness to all generations. And I love that. His faithfulness is not just to me. It is to my children's 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 children. And it goes on. I mean, i, I got to stop somewhere. But it just keeps going. God's faithfulness goes from generation to generation to generation. His faithfulness is seen in his faithfulness to save us. He saved me. I had no right to be saved. I had no right to be saved. There was nothing about me that caused God to look down and say, oh, I want to save this guy. He is such a great guy. I want to save him. He, above, above, no, none of that. God saw me for what I was, a filthy, what do you even call me? Lost, sinful, broken. And he loved me. 
And in his faithfulness, he saved me. His faithfulness is seen in that he said that he has sent his son into the world and that whoever believes in his son will be saved. His faithfulness is seen in that every individual who truly comes to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior is saved. And saved for all eternity. His faithfulness is experienced in holding us up when those around us fail us. No matter how good your friends are, no matter how good your family is, at some point in time, they will fail you. They will. Just the reality of it. Because they're human. And you'll fail them too, so live with it. But he never fails. He never fails. He is faithful to us to the very end. In conclusion, this is such a great psalm. Again, I'm not sure what all is going on in your life right now. But whatever is going on, praise the Lord with no holds barred. What is our take home today? First of all, you are called to worship God. Secondly, know who God is. And third, know that you know that you are not a self-made person. I don't care how important you are. I don't care what position you have. I don't care what prestige you have. You are not a self-made person. There is nothing that you have that was not given to you by the grace and the mercy of God. And finally, know that God is good. God is good. Let's pray. Lord, we just come and we thank you for your great love. We thank you that you are good and that your loving kindness and your faithfulness continue on forever and ever. And we rejoice in that. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us to be a people who truly worship you, that we dare shout for joy when we see you work in our lives. May we dare sing in such a way as to declare the glory of God to a world that desperately needs to see that. I pray in Jesus' holy name.